There we go. So uh, welcome to our mug today. We are going to be diving into all kinds of tips and tricks when it comes to your marketing operations world. Um, we focus a lot on Marketo. The tips today will be some Marketo specific, some more general. Um, so if you're joining us from a different platform, um, there will definitely be some things that you can take away too. Um, so as we get started, like I said, I'm Natalie Kramer. I am the Senior Marketing Operations Manager at Atumos. We are a full-service marketing technology agency um, specializing in all the different map platforms, um, helping people with their campaign processes, platform operations, all kinds of good stuff. And then and Jackie. Yeah, and I'm Jackie Potts. I'm the Marketing Operations Manager at BombBomb. Uh, we're a video tool. Awesome. And then we have a great group of people with us today that will also be presenting. We'll introduce them here soon. But first, we have some fun housekeeping slides to get into. Um, so just if you've been to a mug before, you're used to this. Um, just our user group house rules. Um, please no self-promotion or pitching of any kind. Please don't contact people outside of the user group without their consent. And if anyone shares, you know, use cases specific to their businesses or you know, things that might be sensitive in nature, please don't share that information. And then we will be, as you know, recording the session today. Um, if you're not interested in being on the recording, we will be posting it after the event so you can catch up there. Um, otherwise, we will stop the recording at the end of the session to leave time for questions. Um, so definitely feel free to, to ask anything at that point as well. And then if you are new to the North America virtual user group, welcome and be sure to sign up um, at mugs.marketo.com for our chapter so that you receive all of the updated information, all of our upcoming sessions and everything will be posted there. Um, I mentioned, mentioned at the top with our technical difficulties, I forgot this is part one of two great sessions on this topic. So you can also join us <clears throat> the first week of February for part two. Um, with all kinds of additional tips. So be sure to check that out as well. And then there's all kinds of great opportunities coming up. Adobe Summit is back and happening the last week of March in Las Vegas again. Um, if anyone's going to that, feel free to let us know in the chat. Um, there is a $200 off of an in-person pass if you sign up by February 13th. Um, so be sure to check that out. Um, and I know they're making updates on their website all of the time, you know, with new speakers, um, the full session agenda. So be sure to check that out. And then tomorrow, a little short notice, but if you're free tomorrow, um, there is a new Adobe webinar happening around person scoring um, with a great Marketo Engage champion. So if you have time and are interested in diving in more there, you can sign up for that as well. And then there's also a number of other great mugs coming up still in January. Um, so we're about halfway through the month, but there's a lot of um, virtual sessions and some more in-person sessions happening um, as we get into January and into the first part of February. Um, so lots of good things happening. So be sure to check that out as well. And then there are a couple international user groups happening. Um, those are all in person, so probably not likely to make it unless you're traveling overseas, but lots of good stuff happening there. Okay, all right, onto the good stuff. Um, we have three great speakers with us today. We were supposed to have a fourth, but unfortunately, all of the illness in the world got him down, um, so he'll be joining us on the next month's session. Um, but today, we have three speakers with us, Courtney, Ann, and Ryan. Um, we'll do a quick round robin and do introductions. Courtney, if you want to kick us off. Sure thing. Thank you, Natalie. My name is Courtney Makara. I am based in Portland, Oregon. Um, I've been a Marco <coughs> customer a um, long time. I feel old. I think it's been like 13 years or so. I started when Marketo was a very small little product and before they even had programs. So I, uh, I kind of bleed purple still. And in 2019, I went independent and I have been freelance consulting for about five years. Five years. Um, Anne, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, uh, my name is Anne Sample. I use she, they pronouns. I am a marketing operations. I'm stealing your charger. Sorry? Sorry, go ahead. I just muted oh, them. Okay, okay great. Um, yeah, I'm a <clears throat> excuse me, marketing operations specialist at F5. Um, I'm based in the Seattle area, 
And I've been in Marketo for almost a decade now. I think 2024 is my decade year. Awesome. And Ryan? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Ryan Mansfield. I am a marketing operations manager at Fathom. We're a digital agency located in Cleveland, Ohio. I also co-lead our Marketo user group here. And uh, and I think I just passed my my decade in marketing automation. So a little bit ahead of you, but uh, really excited today to talk about uh, some different tips and tricks with tokens. Awesome. So with all of that, we're happy to have you all with us today. We'll go ahead and we'll jump into the first topic. So Courtney, take it away. Sure thing. So when the call for volunteer speakers came out for this, um, it was what are the quick and easy, simple tips and tricks that you do in Marketo that other people might not know about. And so I'm going to show you some things that I always do for reports. Um, this kind of became a habit when I started consulting because Oftentimes that first week or two weeks with a brand new client, they are like, what do you see? What's going on in my database? Is it healthy? Is it not healthy? What can you fix? And so I learned very quickly um, a couple of reports that I always like to build. So I'll just say to get started, um, I like to review database health and um, I like to organize my database section of Marketo and the analytics section of Marketo just as much as I organize marketing activities. Um, I've been in plenty of client instances where there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds and thousands of smart lists in the database section, um, and it can get really daunting. And I also think that if you ever try to do field management cleanup and you find that a field is used in, you know, 150 smart lists, it can really slow you down if you're trying to remap things or clean up the data. Um, I'm often asked about what does the CRM sync look like? A lot of times if there's churn at a company um, with yes, employees. Yeah, I want she needs to uh, just if you are on the on the Zoom, just to try and mute yourself would be really. Hey, cool. Andrea. Here. Okay, yeah, it looks like we have some people who are not <laughs> muted. Please make I just, sure. Um, I just muted all. So. Okay, I'm gonna unmute myself so I can keep talking. Um, but yes, the CRM sync is often a big question. Many times, if there's a new employee on the team. They aren't aware if a custom sync has been set up in their instance, or if new records or new integrations are being set up like People AI or Discover Org. People can be very unaware of how many leads versus contacts are in the database. So I always build a standard report to show me that. Um, and I think also on here, yeah, how clean is the data? Oftentimes person source, I'm sure we've all had headaches with person source is how many values is appropriate? Do you want 10 person source values or 150? And what do those look like? And then last but not least, um, marketability. That's often a, a top question of, I know my database is 800,000 records, but how many people can I market to? And that can be kind of a loaded question. Are people unsubscribed or block listed or suspended or invalid? And so this is generally the types of reports I build right at the beginning and how I make them um, as user-friendly as possible. So here's a little screenshot of how I like to organize database. It can seem maybe a little overkill and a little, uh, I guess, type A in a negative way to really have like naming conventions and folders, but I separate out firmographic data um, versus demographic data. And I try to group them and number them in order. You tend to start to memorize. I just think it's a human condition of if you know you're going to report on industry frequently or number of employees, you start to know, oh, that's in the number two folder. Or that's in the number one folder. So I really do separate those out. So anytime a new person joins your team, whether it's an employee, whether it's an agency, or I've even had a VP of marketing decide on a Saturday, they want to log into Marketo and start pulling lists. And this makes it so easy for them to just open a couple of folders and find the list that they're looking for versus them never being in Marketo, not knowing the attributes that are important to us and trying to build their own and getting confused. So um, this is something I really ad advise. And you'll see I have some yellow highlighting on there. Um, this I kind of learned the hard way. And I have kind of trained myself to actually put the value that is going to be in the field at the beginning of the name of the list. So you can see it starts with finance, Finance is in the industry field, or finance is an exact match for the industry field, not null and null. And this is because as you build the report and the analytics side, the column headers are always the name of your smart list. 
And I used to do it where it was industry equals finance or industry equals, you know, banking or an analytics. And the column headers all said industry. And I would have to widen all the column headers every time to actually see what they meant. So my tips and tricks for, for your list building is to start with the value and end with the attribute name. You can see at the bottom for number of employees, I started with the number and I'm ending with the attribute name. So you'll see me repeat this on my slides today. Uh, the CRM sync, I mentioned, you know, I always am pulling reports and grouping things by CRM sync. So having lists for the contacts, one for leads and one for null. Um, this has just come in helpful so many times and to just have it as one smart list that everyone in the company can use rather than every single employee having their own folder in database and every single employee figuring out their own smart list of SFDC type. I also find this really beneficial because you will often see the filter SFDC type in your instance twice. It often means the difference between a lead or a contact or a person. Um, and it also can mean a value that is on your page layout or on your attributes. And this way, you know exactly what you're filtering on and you can easily add it into custom columns. And of course, starting with a value and ending with the attribute. And these are the attributes I am always creating my smart lists for. Again, that, that first five or 10 days in with a, a new client or a new instance, as you can see, SFDC type and person source. Um, very common country for geography, for any international businesses. This slide I kind of more put together for a screenshot for anybody that's like, well, what do I do? I, I could do SFDC type and person source. But these are ones that I find myself using the most frequently. Um, industry, number of employees, you know, depends on the size of your business, product interests, and then UTMs. I do have custom fields, uh, sorry, excuse me, custom smart lists for UTM is null, is not null, is valid, is not valid, um, to understand if you have maybe your URL builder might have a typo in it or an error, and then you can quickly and easily see where those are coming from. So now that you kind of have an idea of the database smart list side of things, transitioning over to analytics and the reports. So often people wanna know how many people are marketable? How do I know who I can message? And what does it look like in my CRM? Because the sales and customer success team are really, they're gonna be the proponents of your database and gonna be working with these the most often. And in these screenshots of these reports, you can see right in the column header why I start with the value of lead and end with the attribute. So it's lead equals SFDC type. So you don't have to make those columns super wide and make the report really hard to read. So here's a marketability one. I do it on just unsubscribed, true and false, the ones and zeros. And I also love to do it on my marketability segment. Now, if you would like more details on how I do my marketability segmentation, I would love to talk to you about that. It's kind of a passion project of mine that I've, um, I've done a couple of times now and I've kind of learned and tripped and fallen along the way. And I've gotten to a, a process that I find really beneficial. And this is so helpful. SFDC admins seem to really like this to see, oh, the very first segment for marketability that I have a zero one null, that means the email address is actually empty. And we can see really quickly and easily how many leads and contacts don't have an email address. Well, if they don't have an email address, we likely don't need them in Marketo because we can't email them. I mean, we can obviously still track some, some cookie information for a few more weeks or months, but um, it really helps with cleaning up data and seeing how many people are invalid or unsubscribed and being able to focus on those two objects on the Salesforce side. Uh, source attribution, that person source field can be a, a nightmare for people because it, it's often a fight between marketing ops, marketing, demand gen, sales ops on how many person sources should there be. Marketo would like you to believe that there's like four. There's like list import, form fills, and web pages. There's obviously going to be a lot more. And I often like to group people by person source, see how long that list is to see do we need to consolidate that list and make it a little bit easier to report on? And I like this report of looking at the leads versus contacts versus not in Salesforce at all, because it identifies that right now, um, person source empty, there are no leads where person source is empty. That's great. That means every lead has a person source, but we have a lot of contacts 
and a lot of null records where person source is empty. So it lets us focus on where are records coming in, where we actually need to troubleshoot and make sure a person source is being written into the field when records are created. And I think I have one more example. Yes, demographic data. This is kind of the cleanliness piece. So I mentioned, again, starting with the values, so you can see zero NU, that means the role is null. Uh, excuse me, the job title is null. And so I have that zero in there. So the column can be really skinny and I know that it's empty. And then the exclamation point is for job title is not empty. We actually do have a job title and it's about 14,000 people in that column. And then I've got job title contains product or program or marketing or C-suite. Uh, and again, having that value at the beginning allows your report to be a little bit smaller and you don't feel like, oh, I've got to make it really wide. It's hard to see. I have to export it into Excel um, and then, you know, take a screenshot of the Excel report to put it in my PowerPoint slide. You can actually just take a screenshot right here and I can see, well, I have job titles for 14,000 people, but I don't have role for 21,000 people. Do I want to use one value to fill in and populate another value? So I think that's my quick and dirty tips. Um, hopefully it's helpful to you. And again, if you have any other questions, feedback, suggestions, if you want to poke holes in my suggestions, I'd love to hear it. So feel free to reach out. That was awesome. Thanks, Courtney. And now we're going to turn it over to Anne, who's going to do a live demo of the tool TextBlaze and how she uses it in MOPS. And you're muted. Perfect. Thank you. Classic. Um, so you should be able to see my TextBlaze dashboard here. Uh, so I wanted to start with, you know, what is TextBlaze? So it's a Google Chrome extension. I like to think of it as the Google Chrome analog for on an iPhone texting the phrase OMW, iPhone will automatically replace that with like on my way exclamation mark. This is like that in Google Chrome, but with a lot more bells and whistles associated to it. So this, um, because it's a Chrome extension, it can run in any program or any website that you can use in Chrome. And um, it makes um, what it refers to as snippets. And every snippet is composed of a label. That's just, you know, the description that reminds you what it is. The shortcut, which is what you have to type to get it to appear and then this rich text section which is actually the body of your snippet um, and there's a lot that you can do you know with formatting here it's kind of similar to the marketo text editor um, and there are some basic commands that function sort of the same way that marketo tokens do so you have dates and there's mon uh, many different date options um, there's a way to place your cursor at a certain point inside of the text when you're done and um, to use it, you just um, take your, your short code, type it out, and that puts it in. Or you can, um, especially if you have a lot, I tend to just type part of it, and then you get a list of everything that matches that, and then you can just click it to apply it. Um, so... Oh, another really cool thing about TextBlaze is that you can actually, so things, snippets are grouped in folders and you can share entire folders of grouped snippets with other people. So if you've got other admins in your instance that you want to be able to share snippets with, you can see I have, you know, an F5 demand gen folder that I've shared with the other admins on my team. Um, so I wanted to walk you through some of the use cases that I have come up with for TextBlaze with Marketo specifically. Um, you may not find that these same things are pain points for you in the way that they were for me, but hopefully they give you some inspiration for things that are pain points for you that TextBlaze might be able to solve. So the first one is program statuses. If you're like me, and I hope for your sake that you're not, you have 587 program statuses in your Marketo instance. It's bad. I don't recommend it. Um, particularly because when you have that many, you don't get a select all option when you are, you know, filtering. It's too many for Marketo to parse. And the extra annoying thing about program statuses is that you can't search by the name of the channel. You can only search by the name of the status. 
So for example, if I type in webinar, you don't get results that have webinar in the channel name. You only get results that have webinar in the status name. So this one, even though the channel's webinar only shows up because the status is also webinar. So what I have done for myself is I've made myself a few different text-based snippets that are just pre-made lists of all of the statuses in the groupings that I want to be able to select. So like webinar, for example, if I click this one, it populates with the 42 statuses that are associated with webinar in some form or another. Um, so then all I have to do is, you know, type that out and then click OK. Much simpler than trying to scroll through those results to find those 42 statuses. Another thing that I really like to use it for is segmentations. Um, if you've got a segmentation that has a lot of segments in it, even if your, you know, naming convention is really good, you know, you can see here, I've got pretty consistent prefixes at the name at the start of every segment. It should theoretically be easy. You know, if I wanted to target all of APAC or all of EMEA, you'd think I could just type contains EMEA, but segments don't have a contains function. So you have to select each one individually. I am lucky over here in that there are few enough segments that I do have the add all option, but in the event that I didn't, or in the event that I just didn't want to use it, I have a little short code here. If I type out EMEA, it populates with all of the little EMEA segments, and then I just have to click OK, and they're all applied. And of course, Marketo is going to show the error because it's Marketo. Um, another thing that I really like to use them for is to have tokens that I use a lot saved as snippets. Um, you know, this is the sort of thing that <clears throat> I used to have multiple sticky notes on my computer's desktop with all of the snippets that I use the most frequently pre-populated with their defaults. So like, you know, we use default um, we use tokens for images in some of our templates and the default, you know, is just a blank placeholder image. Um, I could never remember that placeholder URL. I always had to scramble to the design studio to go and find the URL, copy paste it, or, you know, maybe I had it on my desktop somewhere. Um, now, you know, I just have a text place snippet that is the asset thumbnail with the placeholder. Um, I also have made myself, because I use it so often, a second one that's just the placeholder URL. Um, and this is, it's really, it's great for anything that you find yourself, you know, copying and pasting a lot, whether it be little chunks of style tags. Um, if you've got UTM parameters, it's great for pasting all of the right UTMs at the end of a URL. Really anything, you know, that you find yourself digging through your email to, oh, what was that little bit of code again? Or what was that token? Or, you know, anything that you've saved in a doc on your computer somewhere, or you've had to scroll back through your, you know, team or Slack chat to find it. Just put it in text plays. That's available all the time now. Um, and, you know, obviously our focus here is Marketo, but I feel I would be, you know, remiss if I didn't also point out because it's a Chrome extension, you can use it outside of Marketo as well. You can use it in anything you can run in Chrome. So Excel or Google Sheets, um, you can have, if you use, for example, list import templates where things are in the same columns a lot, you can have formulas pre-made and uh, just add in a little formula. Of course, today it doesn't show you the entirety of the formula. Um, but so it's a little pre-made formula. I just type in my little short code. It remembers the whole thing. It has all the columns selected just the way that I wanted. Um, it's also great for ticketing systems. If you take tickets and, um, you know, have the same responses that you tend to send when people submit or if they need to review, you can have a snippet, you know, made for those, uh, those tickets. Um, for email too, you can have entire emails. So, you know, if you have to send emails out when you're launching campaigns, when you're inviting new users to Marketo, anything you have that's sort of like a form response, 
um, you can just have a text place snippet for it. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is on its last leg, I guess. And it even, you know, I've used a couple of tricks here where I had it jump the cursor back to the person's name so that I could put in a person's name. And you'll notice I used a date token to put in happy Wednesday so that it's always the right date and I don't have to go in and change that. Um, so that's, you know, what I had. I hope that it inspires you as much as it has inspired me. And uh, if you want to download it, um, it's just blaze.today. Um, and disclaimer, I'm not a text blaze BDR as much as it, it might sound that way. It's just something that I have found super helpful. And it was the productivity tool that felt the most unlikely that anyone had seen and exciting to share. So that's my time. Thanks, everyone. I think you just saved everyone hours of time this it year. The chat hours, is just sure. yeah. blowing up with positive oh responses. My God. So five thank you so much. I think we're all going to go play with text blues this afternoon. So that's awesome. Oh, okay. All right. So our last presenter, Ryan, I'm sorry. It's the hard act to follow. I, I was just going to say that, Natalie. I don't even know how we how we follow that up. That's that's incredible. And I think you've you've changed my life in the last 10, 15 minutes. So really excited to play with that one. Um, Got to be honest with you guys. I, I wanted to leave with a joke. So I spent like a week thinking about Marketo tokens, jokes, and, and I just couldn't come up with one. So like I do with uh, in many times now, I turned to ChatGPT um, and full, full transparency. All of our comedian friends' jobs are safe. Uh, it did not have any good ones either, but I'll give you the best one. What did the Marketo email say to the token? I can't function without you. Uh, it gave me the slightest little bit of a chuckle. I see a few chuckles there on, on the Zoom screen. So uh, out of the 20 or so, that was the best one. But without further ado, uh, terrible jokes aside, I'll, I'll dive in here. And um, really part of the design for the tips and tricks that I wanted to share was whether you've been in Marketo for a couple of weeks, you're you're brand new to the platform, or like Ann and I, you're, you're measuring it in terms of decades now instead of years, um, wanted to have uh, a really uh, good breadth of, of ideas. So um, some of these are going to seem pretty simple and some are going to be a little bit more sophisticated, but um, really all of the, the things I'm going to share today uh, relate to these three key themes or uh, ideas or reasons as to why you, you set up high level or folder tokens. Um, first being consistency, right? We always want to make sure that uh, we're mitigating the risk of error. Uh, any place we can make something standardized or consistent, uh, tokens are a great way to do that. Uh, second, and sometimes this is overlooked, but tokens can be great for optimizing your content. So whether that's A-B testing or integrating some really cool personalization into your programs, emails, and landing pages, uh, you know that's certainly a, a use case for them. And then finally, probably the most obvious, right, is, is efficiency. Uh, anything you can do within program templates, uh, to really ensure that uh, we're saving as much time as possible. Um, so there's going to be a couple ideas there for tokens as well. Jumping ahead, the the first one I want to cover, and similar to Courtney, right? I spent a lot of time in the agency world just jumping into clients' instances and them asking, what am I missing? What's not here? Um, help me identify some gaps. So when you're thinking about tokens specifically, uh, this is a great place to start. So Think about your own instance right now or the client's instances that you work in and, and think about that top level folder. Uh, that's where all of the marketing communications and, and local assets should live underneath of. Uh, but that's like one of the first places I go start looking at tokens is, do you have something set up there? Uh, so you see those bulleted lists on the left. And really this is, I like to say, it's just like one of the easiest places to get started and start to build those efficiencies for yourself. Um, so these are things that should very rarely change uh, and that are probably going to be used across tons of your different emails, landing pages, and various assets. So things like company name, phone numbers, porting address, right? Those are pretty obvious, but um, a couple of the, the really specific use cases that can end up saving you tons and tons of time down the road are things like tags, lines, or hex color codes. Uh, now that I'm going to have you jump ahead or Jack, yeah. Sharon here, I'm going to have you jump ahead. And this is my my one quiz within the uh, my allotted time here. 
Um, now I'll remind you, I'm from Cleveland. If anybody want to drop it in the chat, have any idea what those two orange blocks could relate to? Bonus question. All right, I'll give everybody a second. There we go, Chris, you got it, you nailed it. Uh, here in Cleveland, the orange is oranger is something that happened like seven years ago. Uh, and, and for those of you who are, who are not NFL or football fans here, um, if you're not familiar, the Browns logo is really just a color. We have an orange helmet, so we're very, very passionate about that orange. But when I started thinking about disastrous situations you could get yourselves into, right, or really sticky, tough situations, um, that basically got announced overnight that we have a new orange. Now, I'm colorblind, so I don't see much of a difference between the two. But I just imagine being in that marketing department, right? People aren't going to realize that you need to throw a ton of resources at it like you might a rebrand, right? If you're changing your name, you're changing your logo, there's a pretty big understanding. That's a huge undertaking. But if something like a color changes, right, your marketing leaders might not realize how big of an undertaking that could be. So imagine all the places you have URLs, headlines, uh, anything that could be used to an email or landing page. So I, I strongly encourage you if you have a good bit of downtime or any day project, uh, this is a great opportunity to go in, create those in your highest level folder. And then sometime down the road when, uh, when your creative team comes to tell you that you now have an orange or orange, uh, it's not a nightmare for you to update. Another good idea there is taglines, right? That's one I've actually been through in the in the past where uh, was brought in as a consultant to update taglines uh, because they realized what a huge undertaking it was uh, to update this across all of our assets. They realized we've got a lot of things that are in market that are you know, already existing creative, they're they're out there in the world and we're going to need to update them. And sadly, in that case, uh, I had to go through and do it manually. So, and a lot of control F on uh, on building assets. So another good one to keep in mind there. I uh, would say this isn't a, an exhaustive list by any means. So encourage you, if you guys have great tokens in your high level folder, please, please share them in the chat. But um, this is another good one. Oh, Courtney, you teed me up. Uh, I just saw that came to copyright year. So jumping ahead to the next slide, uh, I'm sure a lot of people went through, updated your copyright year. You can certainly do this as a token and just go in and change that date to the new year. But a little tip or trick that I learned uh, in the in the past few years is this is a really easy way to get started with Velocity Script. Use one uh, one line of code, which you see there. You set your variable for year equal to date.get. And all of a sudden, you never have to update your copyright again. So if you put in that one little line of code, uh, that's going to specifically get your year. And then you can set that variable to print. And from now on, for the rest of time, you never have to update your copyright. So um, and thanks, Jackie, to sharing that link. Uh, did want to call out. Uh, there's a lot of fun things you can do with dates. So that's another great in my top level folder. I'll usually get today's date. I'll get the current date and time. Um, and you can do that all with you know, just a simple one line of code there using Velocity. Uh, but I highly encourage you to check out, if you're going to get started using dates and Velocity script and you're new to it, uh, that's a blog there by a fellow Marketo user group leader. I'm sure many of you here have seen Sanford's name in the Marketo Nation. Um, he's, he's the GOAT when it comes to uh, Marketo Velocity script. Uh, but that's a really great overview that talks to you about everything you need to know from time zones to locales. Um, just a lot of great tips and tricks. So be remiss to not share that blog. It helped me a lot. Um, but once you bring in really the, the core of this, this slide is once you bring that date in, the current date, current year, there's a lot you can do with it. So uh, bringing that then into things like webinars to do a countdown for invites uh, becomes really simple once you have your current date. But uh, just thought I'd share this one specifically that uh, hopefully this might be the last time some of you ever have to update your copyright again. Jumping ahead, um, one of the really, the more advanced use cases, and, and this is sort of my final uh, theme or use case uh, within, within tokens, is using Velocity Script to create really advanced personalized content. So one of the first one that comes to mind for me are signature lines, right? Uh, typically I find there's a lot of different nuances or reasons, roadblocks, if you will, to using just sort of the native out of the box. Let me just code that into a Marketo module and use tokens, right? Um, a good example of that, I do a lot of work in higher ed. And sometimes that lead owner in Salesforce is not standardized, right? Or 
you think back to your enrollment journey, uh, for those of us that went to college and right, there's a lot of different people who reach out to you throughout that process. Maybe it's admissions, maybe it's enrollment, maybe it's financial aid. So a lot of times those, those individuals information are not in your database. It's not just really easy to pull a token, um, a lead token. So sometimes, uh, you know, you get these advanced use cases and you get really beyond the native functionality of Marketo. Uh, another great, uh, reason here or recent one I worked with is all around account-based marketing, right? So if you're a sales organization and you have a really long sales cycle or complex uh, lead journey, right? There might be multiple people reaching out to you, might not have all that information, but maybe it lives in a custom object. So um, really great idea here is to bring that in and manage it all through one velocity script token. And again, thinking back, right? If you had it at the program level, you'd need to update it everywhere. But if you throw it in that high level folder, uh, maybe it's just your sales outreach campaigns. That's going to cascade down to all of your different programs and it makes it a really, really easy place to update this. So, uh, Jack, if you jump ahead one more, kind of here's my uh, a quick example through a screenshot. But um, the reason why I like this is a good example is it's uh, it's a pretty simple piece of velocity script. So if this is your first time taking a crack at it, you're really just going to create your if logic, uh, which pretty simple one line of code there. You can see in that example with the first text box, uh, made this one uh, just based on a lead state. So if state equals Ohio, uh, we're going to populate all of that information. Uh, then, then similarly for if state equals California in that bottom right text box, we would populate that information with the variables we set on the last page. So um, it it gives you that opportunity to create your own logic within it. So it's not just, oh, somebody's owned by by this record or uh, there's this field in the database. But um, really beyond that, another great example here is you can bring in imagery really easy, right? So sometimes like, you want to set a headshot within your signature line. That can become a headache if you're just trying to do it with, uh, with fields. So uh, one thing I would say there is a, a super pro tip, I guess, if you will, is to um, try to standardize as many things as possible across your systems. One project I'm working on right now with Velocity is from some custom uh, from some custom objects, there's a unique identifier that's actually a product image. And that unique identifier is the same across everything. So I can bring that in as a token right into my URL structure and automatically populate that product image. So um, a lot you can do here and you can really build upon this, but you know, thinking about those three key themes, scalability, efficiency, this gives you one one place that you'd ever have to update this. So, uh, you know, rather than having to wait on your Salesforce team or, you know, jumping through a bunch of data management hoops, this can be just a really simple place to update uh, some really cool personalized sections within your email. So I highly encourage uh, if you're new to Velocity, uh, you know, take some time to learn about it. But this is a great uh, quick example of something you can do to, to really personalize your content. So I've just got a few more quick little tips and tricks that I didn't feel like fit into this. Um, and if you guys have any more, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Looks like we'll have a little bit of time here and I'm sure we'll have uh, some, some great conversation. But um, one, one simple little trick that I like to do is, is use fallback content, right? So um, taking a CTA button as an example, if that's one of your tokens, um, rather than naming that token or putting the content in as button, right? Use learn more. Um, really just helps mitigate the risk of, of error or sending out an email that uh, doesn't have uh, proper language in it. Another piece I usually like to look to is really around as needed content. So sometimes we'll think about things like discount code. Uh, I saw legal disclaimer dropped in the, in the chat when we were going through some of the earlier slides. Those are great use cases, things that need to be updated fairly often. And especially when they do, they're urgent. Great use case to put in a higher level folder token uh, because, right, you wouldn't want to have to go through every email or update the template and then approve all of your emails uh, to change something like some legal disclaimer. And oftentimes that's very, very urgent update. Um, and then remember that uh, that system tokens can be really helpful. So a lot of times I feel like people will get tokens, they're using them in emails, landing pages, assets, but the one place that sometimes overlooked are within uh, your flow steps. So uh, this is a really great way to overcome, a simple way to overcome any data retention policies. Uh, if you need to date and timestamp an activity that occurred, 
You can even concatenate that into multiple fields, but just keep in mind when you're working through and you're creating your flow steps that tokens can also be used there. And then just a couple more on the next slide here, just rapid fire mode. Um, one thing that's helpful when you're thinking about tokens, you're building out your token strategy, um, keep in mind that it might be helpful to reorganize your folders. Uh, it's a great reason to be able to do that. But if you go in and, you know, you've never really gotten down the organization of your instance, but you think, hey, if I just switch this around, uh, I could actually have all of these tokens cascade down. So uh, something to, to remember there. Um, just a quick call out if you're new to Marketo, right? I know I've said emails, landing pages a lot, but tokens can also be used in snippets. They can be used in templates, which is uh, great. So uh, just remember that there's a lot beyond just the world of assets that you can use tokens for. Um, I'm now gonna go make this in text blaze, but uh, one thing I like to do for all my clients is to create a glossary or documentation. Sometimes it's just a quick little spreadsheet that, that keeps reference of all your tokens. Um, it's also really nice to work with stakeholders that aren't regularly in Marketo, just so you can give them sort of an overview, helps them understand how we're using tokens and explain sort of the sophistication of what we do in the marketing ops world. Uh, finally, I do a lot of work with lead scoring. So one thing I am always, always doing is creating a score token, uh, especially helpful if you have multiple scores. That way, let's say, you know, you want to change the weight or the value of an email click. Um, you can go and do it one time, and that way you don't have to drill into every single flow step. Change those, things can be missed, just a little time saver. Um, but lastly, try to keep a consistent naming structure, uh, and, and always remember to regularly audit your tokens. So I like to, to joke that I do some spring cleaning, some fall cleaning, uh, but usually once or twice a year I'll go in, uh, especially where we sort of are the, the global or Marketo admin for a client, just to make sure people aren't doing anything wild or off the walls. Uh, gives you a good chance to refresh, share it with the rest of your organization, and really communicate and come up with um, different ideas. Uh, so I hope all this was helpful. I know we, we kind of bounced around a lot, but uh, my hope was that there'd be one or two things that, that really jumped out to everyone. So thank you for the time and give me a little chance to talk about tokens. Awesome. Again, a great conversation going on in the chat. Thanks, Ryan, for all of that. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left. We can go ahead and open it up to questions for our panelists um, about their topics today, or if you have more general Marketo questions, we are happy to open it up there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. And if anyone